Welcome back, Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We are attacking some of the uh, the big issues with rhetoric. Complicated times require sophisticated techniques. Turns out rhetoric has some of those, like a 2,500 year history of, of that stuff. So some interesting answers in there for uh, more complicated times. I'm Dr. Dan, American rhetorician, escaped professor, used to be a professor, broke out one night and didn't go back and late night comedy writer, founder of Rhetoric Warriors. Uh, the podcast has three purposes, really. I talk to comedians about their politics because why wouldn't you? Always fun. I convert conservatives on here. So send me a conservative that you don't think can be converted and I will start to inch them back towards rationality. And uh, I, I uh, gather persuasion advice from all sorts of people, academics, persuasion professionals, political people, and of course, more rhetoricians on this podcast than you're going to find anywhere else today. Uh, my guest today, this is a persuasion professional. I'm really curious to learn uh, about him. He's got a very interesting background and uh, foreground, what he's doing right now. Master's uh, in education from Stanford, long career in nonprofit leadership, writer activist from Portland, now executive director of Demcast, and he's going to tell us all about that today. Nick Nudson. Thank you for thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So we've never talked before. We've never met. I nope. found you on Twitter. Uh, you look like a guy that's sort of up in all the stuff. And so I thought, you know, <laughs> we'd get together. I've been talking to a lot of people across the big spectrum of all this, all this for the last year and a half. So uh, yeah, introduce yourself a little bit. Like, how do you introduce yourself? Pitch yourself these days. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I, like you said, I, I was a uh, lifelong nonprofit professional um, working in coalition building, uh, development, and uh, Trump happened. And I, that guy, be, that guy, <laughs> like, like, like many of us in the, in the uh, sort of Trump, post Trump and post Trump era activism space. Um, you know, we were sort of radicalized and driven to driven to do what we could. Uh, for me, it resulted in a pretty drastic career change. So um, I uh, <clears throat> I dove into social media. I, I, have, I have a writing background um, from in terms of my profession, um, uh, and and I started to do some blog posts and and um, wrote a couple of things on Huffington Post and. And uh, got on Twitter and and uh, just started to I don't know be, be, I needed an outlet for react you just to, to, to react what, to what, what is the, happening what the fuck just happened yeah and um, and uh, and you know I, I just ended up getting traction um, on on the platform and and with my writing and and started to develop a following and then um, you know. Cut, come to the 2018 midterms, um, I didn't really necessarily realize that I was doing what I was doing when I was doing it, but uh, I was doing digital organizing. I was uh, helping to deliver uh, messaging to digital amplifiers to so that they could um, share information about candidates and races that were critical in the 2018 cycle. <clears throat> and then, um, after 2018, after the after the big win that year, um, I just I had recognized, uh, and and my my co-founder Lori Coleman and I uh, recognized together that um, that there was a huge gap in the communication infrastructure on the left. Um, there are basically a lot of um, missed opportunity in terms of spreading messages because. Everybody was thinking about people in digital spaces, people with social media accounts as um, targets for messaging, and nobody was thinking about them as messengers uh, or trying to empower them as messengers. So that's that's basically what Demcast uh, does. We um, we recruit people who want to use their social media accounts um, to spread messaging that helps the movement. And uh, we train them and connect them together and uh, try and just make a lot of noise in, in uh, online spaces. Um, you know, we, we proceed under the 
belief that uh, messages are more likely to be heard and processed, but if they're coming from people who are within a trusted network, uh, rather than you know a, a, an ad that somebody sees from a pack. Um, so, so that's that's our project. Uh, we, we founded in 20, uh, August of 2019, and um, and uh, made some did some damage and made some noise in the 2020 cycle. And we're looking to have a big 2022 this year too. So, would you say, you know, I'm I'm always curious about the different ways that all the stuff goes from inception all the way through, you know, reception with some type of target audience and this sort of cluster spread distribution pattern, you know, versus a verticalized, you know, build it up here and then keep it coherent all the way through and distribute it at the bottom of the pipe. It's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing that's available these days. I think it's part of the reasons why the, you know, the, the right and that sort of old, what I would call old rhetoric story of paranoia and fear and even the drinking the blood of children is a very old, that's a Nazi story, right? And it's just been resurrected and now spread through their cluster, you know, network. So it's a really interesting time for getting messages, like you said, out with some type of credibility and some trustworthiness using that distribution system, that cluster system, which is really very new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's but but you you can see it every day if you're in the trenches of social media. Um, the 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 belief, the generation of belief uh, in in terms of and, and generation of values and that kind of stuff. Yes, it's happening with the Tucker Carlson's and the Dan Bongino's on the on the right, but it's it really becomes entrenched in the comments <laughs> it's 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 really it's really the the end of it the uh all the hundreds of thousands of millions of individuals who are repeating the lies and uh and uh defining the enemy together um that that really creates the cult <laughs> um and so we're not we're, we're certainly not trying to create a cult uh, you know, our, our project is more about spreading truth and, uh, um, here to truth be a cult. You're the cult of truth, right? There you go. Maybe we are a cult, well, you know, <laughs> whatever is, works at this point. Well, this is one of the things that as I've sort of pulled this stuff as a rhetoric professor for 20 years and, you know, taught this stuff to 18 to 20 year olds way before their brains are ready to absorb it and they're ready to use it in their lives. But you know, some of the distinctions that we've sort of accepted, you know, down the down um, on both sides, but especially on the left, the way we define these struggles, you know, with the right. Uh, at, for a long time, you know, it was Republican Democrat is a fairly safe platform, right? Like it's fairly stable. We all know what that is. Then this sort of will to power Tea Party, you know, uh, comes up and grabs the mask the mask of the of the right of the Republican Party and nobody knows how to configure that anymore they don't we don't have a real story for it yet so it's one of those things like it really is like we call them sometimes a cult and of course we're not a cult I'm like yeah we are we're just a good cult yeah yeah in some ways in, in some ways you're right I mean um and and that and unfortunately that's uh because of how because of how information travels now, um, you know more more than ever, the sort of you know we're, we're, we we operate by brand recognition <laughs> because because people are just uh, scrolling and and there's so many distractions and it's like you, you know we develop these perceptions about what a Republican is or what a Democrat is. And um, and and we we need we need the Democratic brand to be very strong, um, like for the survival of democracy. Um, and sometimes uh, they make it, the Democrats who are in charge make it difficult for, <laughs> for us to help help uh, carry that um, carry that strong brand for them. Um, but for the most part, I think that. Um, it's the um, 
there, there are so many environmental factors that make communication exceptionally difficult for the left. Um, the the social media algorithms that um, that boost uh, the the hate spewing right, um, the uh, hyper advanced uh, uh, media network on the right and 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 radio networks and just uh, the whole infrastructure that they have is so much more advanced than than ours, and plus <clears throat> they're propaganda channels. Right. I mean, they they don't they don't care about things like reporting and truth and that kind of stuff. They're literally there just to grab your attention and keep it uh, for the sole purpose of doing so. Um, and and uh, so there's there's a lot. Uh, and, and then the, the mainstream media organizations. Right. Um, they they're not there to carry the de Democratic brand uh, messaging. Right, that's not that's not their purpose, and and more and more, you know, clickbait journalism and and um, and you know the the cable news uh, ethos um, means that they're just they they want to keep eyeballs, they they want eyeballs, and so they have to be they have to say they have to go to the sort of the horse race and the both sidesism and all this all the stuff that they do. So so the deck is just totally stacked against um against the left um and so that's you know that's one of the reasons that we did what we did is because well okay then i guess we all have to grab an oar right and sure. and 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 help uh and help carry the message where we can well and i think you know you said trump sort of activated you same with me like i i always studied entertainment structures for, from a rhetorical perspective and politics was never really my thing but then trump you know leaped out of entertainment Mm -hmm. into politics and he drug all the entertainment aesthetics and tricks and techniques into a, a you know a discourse realm that had never had to deal with those for real like reagan was a dramatist you know he was a good actor and he could tell a he could, he could do a good dramatic speech but it wasn't until trump showed up with reality show you know techniques and just basically broke politics because before politics you know americans never wanted to pay attention to politics it was boring it was all speeches and grandiosity and and all that kind of stuff trump shows up world you know wrestling federations politics and suddenly yeah you're right it's drug all the media over to that aesthetic so now like even watch i mean cnn's you know clearly being transitioned some the way they're going after biden now yep. you know and it's this sort of hyper conflict aesthetic. And that's the thing that plays in the media. But if you can lay those things out, my thing, I guess, has been like, and you start to teach those to the left and get the left off its traditional anchors, which are wonderful of truth and logic and rationality and proof, but they're limited. Right. You know, story is what is dominating mm. now, like this skewed logic, which is very close to real logic, has basically taken over for logic. With right. a lot of people and story becomes the thing that cuts through it and spectacle and all that so there's i think there are ways of getting the left to play those games still in ethical ways but with a vibrancy that can compete with the unethical do anything you know right and so i see guys like you know on twitter and stuff and i post jokes all day on twitter you know basically just cutting into the right uh and trying to find ways to you know be vibrant enough in the landscape to be seen and followed and all that yeah absolutely there there are there are definitely things that we could all be doing better um and uh and sort of trying to pull some of the effective pieces uh, uh effectiveness uh, out of what the right wing is doing without without taking their you know uh ethos <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. yeah, that's one of the reasons why, like, one of my other slogans is the power of ethical only rhetoric. Mm -hmm. well, if you use that as your anchor, it doesn't have to limit you about methods, but it definitely limits you about using the, you know, the core unethicals like deception and masochism mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, fear, fear poking and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So what's been your favorite part of like, is there like, is there something that you that that you like to focus on as a technique that you're trying to get out when you do your tweets and you're trying to get this stuff to sort of 
you know, penetrate all these different networks? Like, what are some of the things that you've learned? Um, some of the things I've learned, um, people like to uh, interact with and reshare things that they either ag agree with uh, strongly or disagree with strongly. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, um, some of the strategies, you know, to, to try and reach and get amplification on a message uh, also bring, bring, the, uh, bring the trolls, uh, but that's just, that's just part of the deal. Um, uh, so every time I share a message, I try to um, think about the, the people that I'm trying to reach with it and um, have, the, have it relate to them in some way. Um, so I, I might be talking about something dry, like what's in the voting rights bill, right? Um, but, uh, you know, ta tacking on a, a sentence or a, a, a message that will emotionally resonate with, um, with people helps, helps the message to travel. Um, so, that, that this is something that the Democrats in general, like um, as a party and as individual politicians are need a lot of help with. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 the purpose of having a social media account is not to, it is no longer um, to be another place where you can dump your talking points. Right. <laughs> Um, and, and that's where, that's where a lot of, uh, a lot of politicians miss, miss the mark. There are some really, really great and skilled, uh, folks on, on various platforms, <clears throat> like a Ted Lieu, you know, who, who just instinctively gets, uh, that you need to, you need to, you need to state what you need to state, but then you need to poke and prod, uh, the right, or you need to, um, or you need to galvanize um, and say something that that people are going to sort of get, really get emotionally uh, uh, um, moved by, because um, because ultimately in social media, it's interactions are what make content move. Um, it's not a billboard that everybody's going to drive past, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> so that so that's you know that's um, probably my main uh thing like baseline thing that i think about when i whenever i'm sharing information if if i'm if i'm sharing something like like uh, a provision of a bill you know <clears throat> follow that up by asking a question um you know don't don't you don't don't we all want our kids to go up in a country you know where where they can um have a job and also be able to vote or something like that and um you'll just you'll just get a lot more interaction if you're if you're trying to engage your audience and and uh get them excited i think that kind of new communication structures that again i think you've pointed out that um, the left hasn't really adapted to the democratic establishment probably hasn't really adapted to again my I have a dual background in rhetoric and then I was a Hollywood producer writer for late night and I've done stand up for the last 30 years. And so like in stand up, I coach stand up sometimes and it's so it's so interesting to try to get people out of what they've been trained to think public speaking is to over to like the most activated form of public speaking there is, which is like crowd work and stand up like if you want to generate, you know, stuff in the moment there's actually all these techniques. It's not just free flowing, like it's incredibly me mechanical, mm. like getting a piece of personal information for, from somebody. Like if I don't know anything about you, I can't do jokes about you. But as soon as you give me any piece of information, you know, you're, you're basically toast in a good way. I tend not to tear people apart, but uh, because I can now work with that material uh, from a comedic you know, viewpoint. And the same way, like, I think with social media, like you're just saying, like, make sure that you're not doing ads, that you're not doing dead content, that everything is an engagement statement or an emotive statement or a conflict mm -hmm. statement, mm -hmm. so that it does live correctly in that environment. 
yeah, it's just a must. Um, it's uh, it doesn't matter what platform you're talking about if you're if you're on TikTok or if, if you're on Twitter. Um, it, it, it's just social. I think that's that's how we are naturally, and then social media has just more deeply ingrained <laughs> that sort of impulse to just interact with stuff that that's intentionally trying to engage us. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's, you know, I talk to a lot of people in the, in the party infrastructure and consultants and, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're still a, we're still a long ways from getting the message through to everybody. <laughs> they, they still want to, they still want to buy TV ads for, uh, for, uh, you know, people, they, five percent of americans who still actually watch tv right and I, so. I get this a lot too with um so my other my other other careers i have a digital marketing agency back in austin i've worked with tons of tech startups in austin and trying to bring a sophisticated communication build to people that are essentially engineers you know or sometimes business people but they're not communication people and the politics of that is really odd of trying to say look I know you've had this decision real estate power for a long time, uh -huh. but the, the landscape has shifted. Like it's shifted over into this social media world. It's shifted into this new kind of multi-logging. You know, it's there is no dialogue anymore, not online. It instantly gets, like you said, the, there's the troll universe, there's the fan universe, and all those things can end up, you know, skewing your message uh, horribly. Uh -huh. But you have to learn how to talk into it. Right. And talking to that sort of, you know, windstorm of, of messaging is just, again, very new and very different. And you said, right. like, I know you want to build a message and like, ah, we'll put out this commercial and it'll change everything. And I'm like, that's, it's really not the way it works anymore. Right. And that's why, that's why I'm, uh, you know, it, it feels, it almost feels like people either want the, the, the party uh, to like have a, have a really crisp, clear message, you know, that's, um, that we can do by drumbeat. And I, I do think that we need that. Um, but there's, a, there's also just not a way for, um, there's not a way for them to get that message out from a top down approach anymore. Right. And, um, and, it, and, and like you're saying, everything is more of a dialogue. So, <clears throat> making making a statement is not a thing anymore <laughs> you know um in our in our current communication space so um because the people are going to come and attack it and the people are going to come and attack the attackers and um so you get like you said you have to be willing to dive in and and uh and engage in the sort of the ongoing diet uh multi yeah you know, what'd you call it multi not dialogue multi-log i like that the multi-log it's never existed before like this is i try to point this out to people i'm like you know this is a new form of human communication and every time those happen they change everything the printing press when we went from an oral to a written civilization every one of the you know tv it has just dropped a bomb into the culture and to right. societal structures and you know like walter cronkite would have never let donald trump on the evening news you know, he would never have occurred, but he had a 40 year history before that of being known culturally and then blown up on TV as a hero. And people do not distinguish fiction and nonfiction the way that we think they do. And in a digital universe, those become very slippery and, you know, topsy turvy. And you're watching it with the right where I've got a, you know, younger brother who is all of it, like, you know, the, the vaccine is a microchip and all of it and i'm just like thanks you, know, uh, you know going into that mental universe and starting to try to rearrange things i mean you can do work like that but it's so much effort you know it is yeah no i can't i i uh I'm lucky l lucky to be from a clan of uh of solid liberals so i can't even imagine <laughs> what that's like um but but I, I certainly have tried to engage in the dialogue, not with a brother, but with 
with other folks and it's i mean it's effectively deprogramming um that's exactly what it is yeah and and that is not an easy thing to do so yeah it's not these are these are not easy, easily solvable problems um uh but uh be, because of all the stuff that i talked about before the algorithms and the media infrastructure and I mean, it's basically one big brainwashing factory um and um yeah we just we need to keep thinking outside the box keep learning um what works and what doesn't um to where we can use use data to help inform decision making about how to best communicate and uh and just keep trying to beat it back well it's one of the reasons why like i mentioned in the intro that i bring convert conservatives onto my podcast i've got a lot of friends who've either gone over to that you know the red herd thinking or kind of we're always close to it anyway and nobody really has techniques for how to go in and start working with that because first of all they're booby trapped i mean part of the thing in that programming is emotional explosion when you're challenged when you're you know under any kind of attack and so everybody gets blown back by that and they're like oh that's too much and they just quit i'm like that's just barrage that doesn't you know you have to learn like almost like a therapist let people right. do that they'll work their way through it it'll start to mitigate and then you can kind of go in but again these are more sophisticated techniques than most people have for persuasion and so yeah. I look around that's why i started this podcast i'm like and you'll hear me i keep breaking in with oh here's some rhetoric stuff yeah it's no free, i love it yeah. it's free education to me like you know, I can't sit many people down and say like, okay, let's, let's go through this in an organized way. But like, um, I teach people a lot when they're doing family members and stuff about never approach directly, because it triggers them, they'll see all the bombs, but like put little mental thorns in there, like very nicely, don't match emotions, be stay nice and be like, well, you know, Fox News is owned by a foreigner. And they're like, what do you mean? It's like, well, Rupert Murdoch is Australian. He's not American. If he was from China, if he was a different color than you, you'd have lost your mind when Fox came along in the 80s and Reagan just touched him on the forehead and said, you're an American. You know, but because they look like all the other networks and they're white and they're, they talk like news people, you let them right in the door, you know, and they're like, you know, no, but they don't know that he's not American. Right. So it's just a little thing and i'm like and next time you watch fox news you're going to think about that uh-huh yep it's good dropping little landmines because yep. you get you can't do rational talk once people have gone over to irrationality right it just doesn't work right i think Very that's one of the cool things about tweets mm -hmm. you know tweets come in sort of out of nowhere and they can grab a little mental space in people yeah no totally yeah that's that that's totally why I, I why i like that platform and and actually why i like TikTok um uh as a as a platform to not everything that's on it obviously same thing same with twitter but um they're they're very short right it's like you you have you have people's attention for 280 characters or uh you know 15 to 30 seconds in a video and uh and there's yeah you can i've there that you you can you can uh spread some earworms uh and 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 get people uh, or landmines or whatever and get people sort of thinking a little bit differently in a very short amount of time so yeah and especially images which they can't mm -hmm. argue against they can't get them out of their heads right you no know, emotions like if you can think of that you're you're trying to do emotional work with people once they've become you know logically skewed and they're having a hard time with logic they still have emotions and then just do emotion work with them um and it, it's becomes you know it becomes much less challenging in some ways like so one of the reasons i moved back to california is i want to do um some nonprofit stuff like start an ethical rhetoric institute where i can sort of teach these things to people and um also to do some kind of comedy production for the left, but which is uh, built to speak to the right. 
because a lot of things I found like really guys like you, really smart people and clearly good liberals and want to do good things in the world. But your messaging isn't really going to the right, right? It's going to the left to try to amplify engagement and voter turnout and things like that. Yeah. Yep. How do you talk directly to the right, you know, to try to cull that herd? And comedy is one of the ways you can do it. They yeah. trust, it it's it's kind of like, a, you know, it's an imposter that gets in there and then it's like, oh, you did say something bad about Trump, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I think uh, I think comedy is a huge uh, weapon in our arsenal that's being underused uh, in the battle for people's minds. So I think that's a great project to undertake um, from from our end where we uh, we want to get to the point where, uh, you know, each of our so we're basically a volunteer organization. We have um people you, who are volunteering to use their social media accounts to spread spread messages the what's one of our volunteers in marin county california who has a exceptionally liberal uh um sphere of influence on social media you know the kind of stuff that we want to we want we'll want them to share is more around the mobilization um and uh, you know that kind of messaging, but we also have people who are like in deep red South Carolina and whose Facebook um, community is overwhelmingly conservative, um, you know, filled with people from their from their life. Um, and so, with those folks, um, sharing a clip of sharing sharing a a, a sort of insidious comedy clip like like the one you're talking about. Like that's the kind of stuff we want those people to be to be sharing, um, and uh, so um, you know, as we, as we grow as an organization, we want to get really uh, um, good at helping our our volunteers understand who is within their sphere of influence, and then differentiating the messaging that's that that we're sending them to send out, um, so that it's most likely to have an impact, you know, based on who it is that they have the ability to talk to so well and i think that is one of the things that you know the right has again like you pointed out some endemic some intrinsic um, advantages here because they have think tanks that are writing up messages that are being produced by major news organization fox and all the other ones and then handed out you know as script to people and so it's professionals at every step of the way and i find a lot of times when i've talked to people on the left um you know, even people like uh, who've been political trained in politics, I've talked to quite a few political consultants and stuff. And but they've never really they're not message people. Right. You know, and I'm like, well, aren't you bringing like I made this point during the 2016 with Hillary Clinton. It's like, why doesn't she have a, sh a shock comic on staff? Because Trump just keeps hitting her with one liners. And he's so ripe for, you right. know, Right. Like just just ten really sharp lines that she could have just cut him with in her debate, and it'd have been done because he would have right. just fallen apart. Right. And using those kind of super professionals, you know, to to give you what you need as a communicator, you know, again that's Hollywood. Like in talk shows, we even have a guest producer. Like people don't get to tell their they come in with stories they want to tell, like the interview guest, and if they're not mm -hmm. good enough, we punch them up. Like they hand them to the writers and we're like, give them some better lines here. Because it, you know, at the end of the day, a professional message is a professional message and people don't care how right. they there. Right. Yeah. Go to go to the people who are really effective at reaching people, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, and so co comedians or script writers or uh um, you know, um folks like that who who have that sort of rhetorical skill set. Um, I wish that folks would do that more. Yeah, I'm sure you've gotten quite a bit of, of the blowback the, of, you know, coming, trying to come into established organizations and suggesting some alternative pathways. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's more, it's, it, it's more just that, uh, especially with the, with the politicians themselves and the, in the party infrastructure, there's the, the, um, the consultancy class is 
deeply entrenched and they're exceptionally ineffective. Um, and uh, that's a very scary combo <laughs> when, when you're trying to, when you're trying to help ask people to pivot, um, you know, so, so they you know, they wouldn't they'd go, they'd go, have to go through all these, oh, I have to talk to my lawyer, you know, before I could talk to a comic, you know, that's, that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of where these people are. Um, there are, there are definitely exceptions. Um, there are some really savvy campaigners out there who, um, who try and, uh, try and do everything that they can and, and go about it in a good way. But, um, most, most campaigns don't have the wherewithal or the knowledge to, um, to do that. You know, they're largely either volunteer led or, um, you know, or just, in, uh, immersed in this consultancy uh, crap. Yeah, it's a, again, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre world uh, going back and forth between these places. Um, I think like their, their, their models again in, in entertainment for how to do this kind of message construction, even get around budget. Like I work for a radio company uh, for a while called the complete sheet and what they did was every night they would put together a 40 page 50 page document of what happened in the day before in the news and uh, I was a head writer for them for putting together jokes and top lists and little sketches and so when the DJs morning DJs would show up they would sell it to all these radio stations around the country mm -hmm. like four or five hundred radio stations mm -hmm. and when the DJs would show up everything had already been organized for them there, there was material for them to actually say with crisp, you know, fresh jokes. And so they, none of the stations themselves could afford to hire five writers and all these things. So there's probably 15 people it took to put that together, but they could all pay a little bit, you know, as a subscription to, uh, to get access to that stuff. And I think things like that, you know, yeah. look, are a good, are good uh, things to pull out of how, kind of harvest from entertainment production process and bring over to politics but yeah know, it's, i yeah i wish we had that infrastructure that's, that's smart it'd probably be a good yeah i hadn't thought about that one but that'd probably be a good thing to harvest and take over to because like you said they don't have staffs they don't have writers and, right right yeah no i think it, i think i think it is i mean that's a you know the the, the right definitely does that right i mean they're they are way ahead <laughs> with those kinds of strategies. So, which is, you know, to me, that's, I don't care what somebody believes. I tell them all this, this all the time. I don't care if you're conservative. I don't care if you're from a religion. I don't, I don't even care if you're a conspiracy theorist. I don't care if you're a racist. What I care about is how you got there, what persuaded you to get there, and what you're doing to persuade others from there. So, process to me, like if we clean up process, we eventually will clean up, you know, result. And right. so finding things like that, like, okay, the right has a better messaging machine right now. Ergo, they are winning. It's one of the reasons they're winning. Mm -hmm. So you can sit there and complain about it, or you can try to disassemble it or build one of your own. But if they've got an advantage and you don't go after it, you're just asking to lose, you know, and it's hard to see those in a mega way as a, Thing the Democratic Party should be doing, but clearly it, it needs to uh, it needs to happen. Yes, which I think is what you're doing. You're you're clearly building a, a an alternative machine. It, it, yeah, at least for the for the bottom up messaging, that that is absolutely what we're what we're trying to do. And we we um, you know we part of what part of what we do is really curation. So um, you know we try and find engaging content whether it's video or, or uh, graphic um and uh and then we also curate messaging so we work with groups that are testing messages with different con different constituencies um and uh, trying to pluck from um from that knowledge to to construct our sort of sample post language that people can share through their feeds um, uh, it's a very manual, 
process at the moment. It would be great if there was more established infrastructure uh, that uh, that we could that we could draw from uh, instead of having to go knock on doors and try and find it ourselves. But right, um, right. so maybe 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 that'll be a, a big innovation in the next uh, cycle or two. That would be great. Yeah. I Again, I I got drugged back. I got drug over into this because I'm like, you know, all, all my experience in Hollywood and watching the hyper structured building of messages like they've been building messages like on a talk show. You basically show up in the morning and there's no show. There's no script. There's nothing. And within the next three or four hours, a whole show is built cast. It's rehearsed for a couple of hours and then it's shot and it's on a satellite uplink to, you know, millions of people that night. And you watch the speed of that kind of production and everybody that I sometimes think of it as like it's a train on a track, a little small train on a table and all these people, there's like a hundred people around it all working on the train at the same time while it's moving. And everybody needs to know their job. Everybody needs to be great at their job because if somebody screws up the wheel, this thing can't stop. Right. The satellite needs to be fed at, you know, 415 or whatever. And so everybody gets very good at that focused work on building that really strong message and they do it day after day and it's really tight. And so when you see that kind of message production, you're like, then you talk to people and it's like, yeah, we kind of, we're going to get together and brainstorm on this. And I'm like, you are killing me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. For the most part, it's a total shit show. I'll tell you. So if you were like, what, what do you see in the future? Are you going to keep doing, you know, sort of this at the level of, of grassroots? Are you guys trying to grow this into like a more of a, like an established organization that, you know, gets into the democratic uh, infrastructure or what are you guys looking at? I think that we want to influence from the outside. Um, I think that we're, we, we think of ourselves as yes, messaging, but also as an activist organization. And sometimes the best way that we can get communication out is to is through advocacy and and trying to tell the the folks uh, our elected officials on our side how we uh, think what we think they should be doing and and how we're feeling about their work. So um, so I, I think it's important that we stay on the outside, uh, but <clears throat> but work work as much as we can in tandem um, to try and influence the way that the uh, the way that the party handles itself in terms of in terms of communication, and we've 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 made some we've made some good inroads, and we've I think we've we've helped already um, uh, a, a variety of people internal to the party um, rethink how they're doing grassroots engagement and uh, organic messaging. So, um, but no, I think we we want to we want to grow and grow and. Um, you know, we want to um, really streamline our our uh, our internal processes so that we have that kind of message factory. Uh, you know, internally that um, uh, so that uh, the more volunteers we get uh, who are who are trying to share content through us, um, you know, they need to feel like they're doing something that's good and that's fresh and timely and all that kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, if we have hundreds of thousands of people who are doing that um, across multiple social media platforms and all sort of singing, singing from the same songbook, so to speak, um, you know, I think we can at least start making a dent in the, uh, in the right wing dominance uh, in the online spaces. But uh we're going to, we're going to need to grow, grow quite a bit before we can get there, but that's the plan. But, I, you know, I will say like when I ran across you guys, I think you're doing it probably, you know, better than almost, you know, everybody else I've seen that's doing the type of stuff that you guys are doing. Like you look professionalized, you look like you've thought this through, you know, everybody looks like, you know, they, it, it doesn't feel like super grassrootsy, you know, it's Good. Like, like there's some actual uh, texture and heft to it. So I'm glad you I'm glad you feel that way. <laughs> yeah, because there, there's a line where you, you know, you, um, you want to be organic, not just in the technical sense, but in the sort of messaging sense, right? You want, um, 
you want things to feel authentic. Um, uh, but like you said, you also don't want to look like a Mickey Mouse operation. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think we've, I think we've, uh, uh, done a done a good job in two years to get to where we are, and and hopefully by the time the twenty twenty four cycle starts, we've got a massive operation that can really really do some rhetorical damage. Yeah, there was a story in the news cycle uh, on a month or two ago that the the uh, left had squandered uh, Obama's grassroots, you know, uh, infrastructure. You, you have to be on the inside of that. What do you think about that? Or like, is that an actual, you know, thing? Yeah, I mean, one of the, actually one of the reasons that we are determined to stay on the outside is because um, every time, especially with presidential campaigns, um, but also with any, uh, you know, office, um, a, a candidate will come in and they'll say, oh, we need to spread, we need to, engage our folks to help spread messages. So they try and build up, you know, a sort of a digital, digital messaging uh, army, you know, and, uh, and then they, they work and all those volunteers work really hard and then the, they win and then they just disband, right? Like, like there's no more messaging to do after the campaign's over. It's like, ah! Um, so we so one that's that's really what we're trying to be is the permanent digital infrastructure so that you know whoever the you know if it's Biden or Harris or somebody else who's the who's the nominee in 2024 when when they when the when their campaign realizes oh wait we need we need digital messengers they can come to us and be like yeah sure we can we can uh, we can help help to we can offer that opportunity to, to this you know tens of thousands of people who are already skilled in delivering digital messages on on whatever platforms they're on so um you know and and same goes for congressional races or or gubernatorial runs or or even just state level state level races and and in some ways the the this strategy has an uh, outsized impact on the um on the smaller races um the the state house races and 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 those the state assemblies and that kind of thing um because they have no infrastructure those they have no money and um and uh they that their their digital director is you know a uh, college intern right not the college interns are bad but um come on no. uh, they're terrible. Those are <laughs> but, um, so we've seen some some of our most thankful uh, candidates who who really feel like our network made a big difference for them in 2020 were those state state house level uh, races, particularly in Georgia, where we have a really strong um, uh, base of volunteers. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I think as the keepers of the flame. The keepers of the kingdom, you know, this idea that, and this again is why there's some construction going on next time. <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy. But um, that what you find with, um, again, Hollywood, like they've already got the net networks, the syndicated uh, stations. They've got, you know, like the big syndicates, like, um, you know, that the right has in, in radio and everything else, like they've got the locations pre-built. Right. And they, so they can distribute new messaging through them at any time. And you're basically building a little network, you know, a digital network that could be, you know, modeled after the, you know, studio networks in the same way, like if it has that strength and you know, you've got to rely on and you understand what each one of those messaging nodes needs, you know, so like, you know, oh, we, well, we don't send the, you know, um, snarky New York talk show to this place in Georgia because they'll hate it. Right. But we definitely will send them some Larry the Cable guy, you know. Right, right. And so you can start to, you know, get that sophisticate, sophistication to your distrib distribution as well. Like you've yep. got infrastructure. Yep. Yep. That's the plan. It's a good one. I like it. So you'll Thank be you. the new Rupert Murdoch social media uh, infrastructure, but 
but you'll be sending good things after it. I like it. And I'm and I'm American. Yeah, and you're American. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, about it turns that? out that foreigners don't really care about Americans. They just want go to, figure. Huh. Weird. Huh. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by again as a message person. You have the issues, and then you're like, okay, how do we message wrangle these issues into something that is vivid and vibrant communication? And then how are we to drop it over, you know, under the population? And every place that you move, there's just so much uh, potential dysfunction and, and messaging failure. And you're like, no wonder it's hard to get something from here to here intact. And why it's so powerful if you verticalize like the way the right has big money balloon at the top think tanks you know dropped all the way down and then dripped out into the population and it turns out if you repeat script over and over and over again it's pretty good at penetrating neural networks and replacing thought yep you know yep that's the that's the key repetition the key to the key to political message well to all messaging is repetition um and that the right gets that in a way that the left just doesn't quite yet yeah, and it's, you know, like Freud called uh, psychoanalysis the talking cure and basically was like, yeah, if you want to rewire somebody's traumatized neural network, which is frozen like that because it's such an intense experience, you have to talk to them as a nice person for many years sometimes. And it's so much of that stuff can be just pulled right over into the big political process of, yeah, yeah. turns out if you watch two hours of Fox a day, it's going to imprint pretty hard. Yeah. And you yep. can't just break through it by saying, but, you know, logic doesn't work anymore. But the scientists say, right. Yeah. I, I've had some good, you know, conversations with guys on the right about like Fauci. I'm like, let's just glory in how illogical this is. Like, I don't care that you believe it, but this, like, I had to work for like 15 minutes to get this guy to admit that Fauci, who is a 50 year history in the medical field and you know, all this credentialism knows more about medicine than you do, who does has a podcast in South Carolina. Right. Like not virus, but just, right. let's just say that. And it was so hard for him to give it up, but he finally did. Right. Well, and I, I do think that story matters a lot. And um, like you were saying before, and you know that's something that we can be doing a lot better is especially given smartphones and the ability of pe for people to um just record themselves saying stuff you know that's why tiktok's great um you know we we can do we can do a lot better as as we get more sophisticated but more generally on, in our movement of um you know using in people's stories to help underscore political narratives uh and and points about things like policy um it's easy to yell at biden about the vaccine stuff uh but uh, it's harder to yell at somebody who gets on their their uh cell phone camera and talks for 45 seconds about their experience with long covid and how debilitating it's been right yeah. well, um, i think Again, this is why I think one of the things I said when I originally contacted you was like, I'd love to drop some more rhetoric, rhetoric into the left because like storyism and narrative rhetoric, like it's I always teach people this little triangle of it's all villains, heroes and victims. Like if you just get those three things in your head and you just play those games all the time, you'll understand, you know, narrative and politics, especially But like, you know, just turning the right is good because they're not attached to truth. If they want to turn you into a villain, they just turn you into a villain. And the left is like, we've got to make sure that it's a an accurate villainy. You right. know, I'm like, no, the, right. the villains can always evade your accuracy. I mean, that's what they do in courts of law. Look what Trump is always jumping away. Hey, you can't catch me. Right. This is Biden. You know, they just post pictures of him. The one I liked was the one about Fauci uh, experimenting on beagles, like ki killing beagles. Did you remember that one? I, I don't think I saw that one. It had a short news cycle, and I don't think it ever made it up into the major news because it was just too, you know, wrong. But it was basically Fauci uh, personally uh, legit uh, gives permission to do uh, 
inject beagles with like some virus to study it. And, I'm like, and they had two dead beagles there. I'm like, okay, I get it. Like going after beagles, that makes you a super villain. But just that villain victim hero, right. you can just play those games like, oh, you're trying to make my guy a villain. And I met a, a lot of times when, again, when I'm converting conservatives, I'm like, I'm like, you're trying to make my guy a villain. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, look at the meta process. Okay, so it's just a game. It's just a rhetorical game at this point. I'm not going to let you villainize him. I'm going to yeah. re-heroize him and villainize your guy. And you're my victim right now. <laughs> right. You can't keep up with what, you know, those techniques you know, once they're sort of blown up as, you know, where you can see them, they don't really don't have a response. But stuff like that, I think, is yeah. fascinating when you drop that technology into, again, good liberal people who are working hard to get stuff done. You know, like, hey, let's give you some, let's give you a little of this rhetoric and see how it goes. Totally. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, I'm, I got you at about an hour here. Um, super fun to talk to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, doing great stuff. I will, um, I will uh, edit this and get it out. Uh, and that's my amplification of your, of your mission. Uh, Appreciate it. To my YouTube, hundreds of <laughs> followers. That's great. Every, uh, every, every little bit makes a difference in this world. And, and if people want to jump into your network and do some amplification from, you know, whatever mm -hmm. they've got, I do have quite a few entertainment people mm -hmm. who are great for this kind of stuff. Like I'm old friends with Ken Chung and, you know, mm -hmm. all, all these guys like celebrity ends up being like the easiest way to do all this. Right. Right. Because they're such already, you know, actuated nodes, but yep. what, how should they get in touch with you? Uh, people can reach me directly. Um, just uh, Nick at demcastusa.com. Um, you can, if, if, if you're a social media user and you'd, like the idea of sort of join, joining the team, um, you can, uh, regardless of what platform you're on, you can go to demcast.com uh, and uh, there's a sign up button right at the top and, uh, and we'll get you hooked in. Awesome. Well, good luck with it, man. Uh, I'll check back with you because uh, again, I think it's fascinating these new things that are being sort of populated on the left that will have some traction, I think, against fighting, you know, the infrastructure, the messaging infrastructure of the right. So. Good on you, man. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Okay. We'll see okay. you. Okay. Bye.